Patrick McGinnis. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I feel like this is going to be part interview, part college-like reunion. I yeah. can't <laughs> believe we're getting together in this virtual room after how many years? I don't, I, I don't even know. I, I think left. it's like, it's got to be 20 years. Yes. Let's see. We both graduated college in 1994. Is that possible? So 98. We were, 98. I'm 98. Yeah. High school, 94, 98. And we started, you started the same. Did I start the same year at the bank as you? I think yeah, so. you started like within a month or two of me. I think, okay. Right after me. Right. You were probably Albertina's class. And then I, basically for listeners, we worked together in our first job right after college. <laughs> I don't have so many memories of those days, Patrick, but I do remember us. I do also remember we probably learned Portuguese together during lunch break, right? We were you did. In that I remember working on these deals. There was all these deals like a supermarket. I remember that you were very stylish. Oh, <laughs> Very, very stylish, but you had these very high heels. And I always was concerned that you were going to have a foot injury. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. I remember working on that Argentinian deal with this like big butcher company, whatever. And then I moved to Argentina with the bank and we parted ways because I never came back. <laughs> I, I, I forgot that you moved to Argentina. I was probably yes. so like so jealous because I love Argentina. So yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. That was the one good thing that came out of that. They transferred me to Argentina. It was amazing. And then I said, I don't want this life anymore. I'm not coming back to New York, New York. So, and that's when we parted ways. We both went to business school right after, I guess, although maybe you went after me. I don't know when I, I went to business school, like in uh, 2002, I want to say, same or thing. 2000. Yeah. Same for me. Yeah, around the I same time. Okay. But let's dive into what happened to you in business school, because this has led to the topic of today's conversation, FOMO. You are the author of Fear of Missing Out, phenomenal book. You're also the host of the FOMO Sapiens podcast. So we have a lot to unpack, Patrick. Um, why don't we get started? Why don't we get started? First of all, like what a surprise. Like I hear one of my coworkers coined the term FOMO, which we used all the time, basically. I mean, Take us back, Patrick, to that day or those days in Harvard Business School when, you know, what was going on in your life and presumably in your in your peers' lives that led you to even find a term to whatever it is that you were experiencing and, and not just even find a term, but to go to the extent of writing about it and making this term publicly accessible to your Harvard community. What was going on? So what happened was this. I grew up in a small town in Maine mm -hmm. and I mean, I don't I remember I, that. Yeah, I don't quite remember what I, how I felt before I went to Harvard, but you know what I was, when I was in college, I, I was always in the library. I studied all the time. I had no FOMO because I was just like in a book the whole time. Mm -hmm. Then we came to New York and I, you know, we worked a lot. And like, so I was kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, I was just focused on getting things done. And then when 9-11 happened, I was in New York City. I saw it that very day with my own eyes. And I remember just saying, thinking I had taken my GMAT on September 10th, mm -hmm. 2001. And then I went out that night to celebrate that I had finished it. And then 9-11 happened. And I was sort of like, wow, the world as I thought it existed doesn't, it's not the same. And like every minute is so precious. And like, you, you can't take things for granted. Kind of like we're feeling a lot these days, right? With the yeah. pandemic. And so when I got to business school, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm in this amazing place. I never thought I'd be in a place like this. I also realized my own mort mortality. So I want to like do everything. And I did, I tried to go, mm -hmm. I mean, I would go to company presentations for things I had no interest in. I would interview for every job, things I, I don't know why I was interviewing. I went to every party, did every trip, you name it. And I realized pretty quickly that I was stressed out and that actually all this opportunity was giving me anxiety, mm. but I wasn't the only one. Everybody was like that. The culture of the school was like that. And so I started calling it FOMO, fear of missing out as kind of a joke. And it caught on with all my friends. And so basically before I graduated, I wrote this article in our school newspaper all about FOMO. And over the years, like through a bunch of stuff that happened, it became this term that made it into the dictionary. Wow, that's incredible. And these also, was this around the Facebook time? Was this Zuckerberg was around while you were there? Yeah, so while I was 
doing FOMO, right? Wrote my article about FOMO across the river. Mark Zuckerberg had just created the first version of Facebook. Mm -hmm. And in fact, over the summer, he, he, he rented out um, like between our two years, we all go off and do internships all over the world. And one of my friends rented their dorm room on our campus to Mark Zuckerberg, who trashed the room and she wouldn't give him back his security deposit. Wow. So he was a <laughs> troublemaker. <laughs> you know, I could, I could totally relate from, uh, to what you said. Cause when I was, I, I went to NYU at the mm -hmm. same time as you were at Harvard. Um, I went back to New York for grad school for my MBA and I felt the same way, except I did the opposite of you. I really just like shied away from me. Like it was just too much. <laughs> like yeah. the amount of options and the pressure I felt to be in all these events and these recruiting opportunities and these networking opportunities. It was so overstimulating, Patrick. I was like, what have I done? Where am I? I don't think I belong here. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's true. Like I'm feeling, you know, I felt that way constantly. And my reaction was to try to do it all, mm. which I think was a reaction to the fact that in college, I was, I just didn't do any, I was so in the books that I was like, I'm going to do it differently this time. And it right. was fun. But frankly, you know, the problem is I thought I would graduate and come back. And then I was like, this is a really high class problem in this very weird environment, like an MBA program, but like, I'll go back to the real world and there won't be this stuff anymore. Ah. But of course, thanks to social media and all of these other sort of information overload. Now it's not like a niche problem anymore. It's something that affects, you know, the majority of people. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us to my next question. Is this really, I mean, who's catching this bug really? I mean, we, we both felt it. We dealt with it in, in different ways. And by the way, it's funny you said that because I felt like I did the opposite also in college In college, I did do it all. And I think when I went with to grad school, I already came from that perspective of like, no, 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 I'm not burning out. I'm not doing this. Right. But back to the social media aspect, like, is this now become like exclusive to, you know, every Instagram user out there, or is there something deeper here that we really need to be aware of? So there are a bunch of factors. There's been an incredible amount of um, psychologists, mm -hmm. clinical psychologists that have studied FOMO. And so I was able to, when I read my book, when I wrote the book, I did a ton of research and read, you know, all these journal articles. It was kind of fascinating. And I've continued the, 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 the sort of the literature around FOMO continues to grow over time. And so what, what I've learned and what I think we were learning is number one, that there is a strong correlation between screen time and FOMO. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the more time you're spending on, especially social media sites, whether that's LinkedIn or Instagram, for me, it's LinkedIn. LinkedIn is my, is my kryptonite. Is oh, that I should tell you to teach me. I, I don't think I've reviewed my LinkedIn profile since those days. That's sad. Well, that's embarrassing. Way, because it's going <laughs> to stress you out because you're going to see all these people, you know, doing all these amazing things. And even if you're very happy in what you're doing, you're always like, oh, like I, why that person has, you know, CEO of a public company now. Like, what have I done? Right? I'm scared. What do I have? But I don't even want to look at my profile. It's probably so embarrassing. Can you check it out and then tell me? <laughs> yeah, sure. You got it. You got it. No. So that's okay, so the thing. On we get all these data points. Yeah. And what happens is when we see these data points, we then end up constructing a narrative inside of our yeah. head. What if I'd done that? What if I'd bought Bitcoin in 2012? You know, all this stuff. And that creates anxiety. And that problem is that that anxiety is completely invented and imposed upon ourselves. It's a right. self-created problem that is inflicted upon us by external sort of forces. Mm -hmm. But that at the end of the day, you know, it's all happening inside of your head. Mm. Now, let me ask you, because you talk about this in the book, and maybe you, I think you even did in that um, legendary Harvard um, review article, um, FOMO has a first cousin, so to speak, FOBO, right? Yeah. Could you, is it, would you consider it like there, are there two sides of the same coin? Can you maybe explain the differences between them? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I like the way you put that about the coin, because FOBO, fear of a better option, is the mm -hmm. idea that if we are making a decision, even if we have a perfectly acceptable option in front of us, mm -hmm. should we keep looking for something better? It's like, oh, I got the job offer from JP Morgan. Well, you know, and which I would have been happy with a year ago, but maybe I need to get Goldman Sachs now. You know, that's the kind of right. the thing. And it is very related for one reason and one reason alone, which is that they're both, both based on living in a world with 
kind of information overload, mm -hmm. lots of different options. And they're based on the fact that perception, we have the perception something better, but we don't really know. And so therefore we're telling a story to ourselves about this mm -hmm. thing that's better without actually knowing whether it's better or not. Mm. So is that to suggest that perhaps our parents and grandparents didn't have this struggle? The struggle wasn't as real as it is to our generation and the, and the younger generation even more so perhaps? It, think about your grandparents. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't know your grandparents, but the, anybody's grandparents. Right. You grow up, you live in some neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know 250 people or yeah. whatever, your community. Um when it comes time to date, you have like five people to choose from. Right, limited options, right? Yeah. You're like, <laughs> when you go to the store, there's like 10 pairs of shoes to choose from. Right. You have, you know, I mean, and it's in some ways it's, listen, the fact that we have many opportunities and options is wonderful, mm -hmm. but FOBO is an affliction of affluence. And yeah. the reality is if you go to places around the world that don't have as much sort of selection, Mm -hmm. People don't have these problems. And so there's like, I've got to be a happy medium, right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about that because as I was preparing for the interview, I'm thinking like, if God put this within us and within us, if this is a reality that we tend to have these fears, right there. And of course it's exacerbated by the fact that we live in an affluent world and we have so many options and we have social media and all the things, right. But, but, but there's something innate in, within, within us that we have. There has to be a positive side to these foes, isn't there, Patrick? And what would that be? Okay, so FOMO does have positive attributes. And so okay. we get on board with that. And FOMO, I, I always explain it like this. FOMO is kind of like having a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. Glass of wine is good for your health. Maybe you relax a little bit, have a nicer conversation. Maybe, you know, you, you get on the dance floor because you're, you're not so shy anymore. Um, too much fo, too much wine not good. You're going to feel bad the next day. You might do something inappropriate, whatever. FOBO is like cigarettes. Cigarettes may feel good in the moment. There is no, nobody in the world will be like, well, having a cigarette is good for you for these three reasons. There's no, there's right. nothing good about a cigarette. Right. Same with FOBO. Wow. I like that analogy. That, that really, that's, that's very, very clear. Now let's talk about you know, we talked about how we all have, we're in this world of affluence and all that, and we have all these options. Is there something that you've noticed as you've studied this over the years? And I know for your book, you interviewed a lot of people mm -hmm. um, that you feel like makes us, makes some of us more vulnerable to fall prey to this malaise? Absolutely. And, you know, I think, first of all, there's, there is a clear correlation between our age. So younger people, are, they tend to experience a lot more FOMO yeah. um, because frankly, you're still, you're still collecting data about the world around you. And so Thank when you. you're, you know, 40 years old and you've been to every restaurant, you, like when somebody's like, Oh, let's go to this hot new restaurant. I've like, I've been to a million, it's, I, yeah. it's a restaurant like, <laughs> yay. Right. It's the stage we're in Patrick. Like, exactly. Yeah, been there, where, done that. <laughs> yeah. You've been there, done that precisely now. So like that happens now, funny enough, as you get older and you have less time, because you know, listen, I'm getting older, then you want to do things before it's too late. So you mm. kind of get FOMO back again. So there are those correlations between age and experience. And I think there's also a real correlation about knowing, you know, being really in touch with who you are. Mm -hmm. so if you are deeply integrated and you know, and whether, you know, whether that's through religion, whether it's through values, whether it's through, you know, a sense of purpose and mission about your life. Right. Then you're like, you know, okay, you know what? There's all these things I could be doing. I could be, but I know that where I'm supposed to be right now is building this company or building this business or raising this family or whatever that is for you. Mm -hmm. and then, you know, you kind of know you have your priorities, but if you don't have that, if you're lost, if you're trying to figure yourself out, and I think we've all been there, I certainly have been, yeah. then the FOMO is like paralytic. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, the, having that sense of mission and purpose and that clarity is definitely an antidote to this. Um, I love that. So you mentioned in your example, business, before we even get to the intersection of FOMO and our financial lives, which we can have a field day of oh, there, yeah. right? Um, why don't we talk about it a little bit from the angle of business and entrepreneurship? Because I think both FOMO and FOBO can really show up 
in the in, in that context to the detriment of our business growth to the detriment of our teams to the, the to you know maybe you can elaborate a little bit and give us a little bit of an illustration of what would that look like in the context of business and entrepreneurship absolutely so fomo can be listen fomo can be great for a founder because fomo is a powerful motivator yeah. and so you say you're sitting in that corporate job and you and you feel stuck and you're unhappy and then you notice your friend from college or somebody in your community has started a business and you're like, this happened to me. I saw people that started doing angel investing and I felt jealous. I felt FOMO and I didn't want to accept that I felt that way. I felt very ashamed of my feelings. Yeah. But when I realized that it was actually that I wished I was doing it too, mm -hmm. then I had a plan. So like, it can be a wonderful thing as long as you kind of are in touch with that. Right. But when you get, when you get into a business, especially let, like think about an entrepreneurial business where, you know, we all know that ideas and entrepreneurship are, you know, a dime a dozen, dime a dozen. executions, all that matters. And if you're spreading yourself too thin and trying to do a million things because you have FOMO, it's like, you know, say you're starting a company and you're trying to launch seven products at once, but you don't even have one of them that works like that. Mm -hmm. That is a huge problem or that your competitor does something and you feel you always have to respond in kind. Those can be very distracting. That's what FOMO is. It's distraction. And on mm -hmm. the FOBO side, what happens is if people, you know, they die by the thousand cuts of analysis paralysis. It's sort of like, you know, um, well, you know, we, we're not going to put this onto the market until it's <sighs> absolutely perfect and everything is tied up in a bow. But, you know, if you read The Lean Startup, which is a book that I think all of us should be reading, it's sort of like, no, there's no perfect thing. You have to put a product into the world yeah. and then learn, right? So those yes. are where FOMO and FOMO can really kill entrepreneurs. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you remind me of, I, I remember recently, my husband, who's a natural entrepreneur, but he, he, he was stuck in a corporate job for a while while he was doing his own thing. And one of the most frustrating things for him was this this over analysis of projects, like we got to get moving. Like, yeah. like this is not how the world works. It's like things just get tabled and tabled because like we're sitting on 10 iterations of the same model and 10 different scenarios to cover our bases. That's no fun. <laughs> you just threw me back to remember like in investment banking days, we'd build these financial models and you would like spend a whole night doing it. You'd be there oh, till like midnight, midnight or two in the morning and you come back and they'd be like, okay, so like change this assumption by 0.5 in the, and you would take all these little changes to the model that didn't actually prove, it was all just Anything. analysis paralysis. Right. And I remember just being like, this is so dumb. Yeah, <laughs> right? I remember too. I remember too. And like thinking like, why am I doing this exactly? Like, yeah. this is dumb. It's not exciting. Can we move through the deal? Can we progress people? Right. It's like anybody with half a brain can look at the numbers and be like, this makes her sense or it doesn't. And changing an assumption by 0.75 is doesn't, not going to do it. Because right. it's all, by the way, it's all assumptions that you're cooking up anyway. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, it, it's funny because only about an hour ago, I was meeting with a student of mine and she was going through this process of honestly having some FOMO because she has a perfectly acceptable job, some things she doesn't like about it, but she also has this dream of starting her own. She really sitting on a gold mine basically, and she could start something on the side. So like, maybe I should just go all in on this, but I really need this job to pay the bills. And I was like, you got to read the 10% entrepreneur. You don't have to go all in my dear, like really there. So, and I know that's, that was your book before this one. It's something that you yourself practice and preach. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? The 10% entrepreneur and what led you to this topic? Because really it is related to this conversation as well. Yeah. I didn't realize it. It's funny. Like I am. So the thing about me is I'm not the most structured thinker. Um, ever. I'm quite I, surprised because I read your book and I'm like, wow, this is really structured. And I read it critically like that because I'm working on my book as well. So like, excellent. I'm very impressed with people who can really structure their books. I was That's impressed. called editors. Okay. Yes. My, my, my idea is, I mean, that's a whole other topic about how I write these books, but I am a not, I'm a little Jackson Pollock in my life mm -hmm. that I throw a lot of things and then I start to see them form like a Rorschach test. And then I, and then I can see them and I understand them. I can contextualize, but in the beginning, it's very messy. It's like the dough is being made and it's kind of yeah it's, it's getting beat up. And so when I, when I wrote the 10% entrepreneur, I didn't think about it in the framework of FOMO, but of course now I look back and I'm like, well, the reason I did basically, this is what happened. 
I was working on Wall Street after business school. Mm-hmm. I got this job in private equity in emerging markets. I was thought it was like the perfect thing for me, which I realize now, like I was so trying to fit myself. I was like pushing, pushing myself into this like square peg with the round hole, just I because I was like the you know, it was what we were supposed to do, right? Yes, it sounds like exactly what you wanted to do when I knew you back then. Exactly, I was like, <laughs> and then I, but you know, what you realize is like, I'm pretty media, I was mediocre. I was like, fine. I would have never been great at it. And frankly, like it didn't capitalize on the things that I'm truly, that I'm yeah. truly like differentiated at, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, but I was doing that stuff. And then 2008 comes, my company was AIG. It blew up all over the papers. We had like protesters, like my stock fell 97%. I had like all these health issues because of the stress and I woke up and I was like, oh my goodness, I've spent all this time doing this career that like, I'm very, I'm totally unhappy and Mm -hmm. I'm sick and I hate this stuff and I don't have faith in wall street because like it let me down and I'm not diversified. I had all my, wait, wait, what? Right. I mean, you think about it. You had all your stuck in your company. No, no, but like, think about this. You work in a company, yeah. you're in there, you, you're buying their stock because of the stock plan. You have all this, you're, you know, like, like I carry in these private equity funds that, so like, it's like everything is in this bucket yes. that I thought was so safe and it wasn't. And so then I said, forget about it. I'm going to mm-hmm. take, I'd saved all this money because I'm, I always saved a lot. Oh, I'm going to start investing it in different things, diversify startups and real estate, all these things. I'm going to be an investor and advisor. I'm going to start things. I'm going to create a portfolio that belongs to me that I made that no matter what my job is, no matter where I go, I can take it with me. And that's what I started doing. And then that turned into this whole methodology that I write about in the 10% entrepreneur that now, you know, many, it's kind of awesome because I get so many emails from people who've been doing this and that have really built things for themselves and that can maybe even start a company and leave their job someday, but they don't just quit day one. They started on the side and maybe they never leave their job, but maybe they do. And it just allows them to build something that is theirs. Right. But when you started this, you, were you laid off? Like you, how, how does it work? Cause how were you paying the bills? You were just relying on your savings. No. So what I did was, oh my goodness, never do that. that okay. Is stressful. Don't want to do that. So I had, I stayed on for a while at AIG uh-huh. and that was kind of a period of transition. And then I left, um, but I stayed on as a consultant. So I was still working for them, but oh. you know, with flexibility. And then I started doing like consulting work. I was doing like freelance consulting work and I was making a good living, but I realized something really fundamental, which is Mm -hmm. having worked in a VC firm where you have equity, you know, ownership in the companies and they, you know, if they grow, you do well. When you're a freelancer, like the minute you end a project, like you don't, even if you do the best job in the world, you see no upside. And so that's where I was like, no, I need to find ways to get ownership in all these things. Wow. Yeah. No, I love that idea. So, so it's not just, so the, the ownership piece, I think it's very novel because we do hear a lot about, you know, start the high side hustle and do the thing, but you're taking an even, an, you're going deeper with this. It's not just start your side hustle. It's really diversify your funds and your time and energy evaluating other profitable opportunities that don't necessarily entail, entail you building your own thing from scratch. That's exactly right. The way I think about it is like, you know, obviously you need to generate income and generating right. income is how you, you live. Right. But if you look at anybody who's really built wealth, mm-hmm. it's because they have an ownership in something that grows, right? right? And so that's I've just tried to get as many ownership stakes as possible. Mm -hmm. I have like more than 20 things I've done. And some of them have done really well. Like our friend Marcelo's company has gone on to become a big, big company. And I invested very early and some things have not done anything at all. But the idea is you build that portfolio. It's diversified. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about get rich quick over a year or three years. I've been doing this for a decade now. And so, you know, it's about, it's a lifestyle that you will, that you will, come to love because you're choosing things that you enjoy. And so it just feels like fun and you do mm-hmm. it with people you like and you, you learn and you grow. And it's just like, it's just a wonderful way to build wealth while also, you know, exploring who you are. 
It's interesting because I, I wonder from the perspective of those listening, they might hear us talking and they say, well, you know, he has experience in venture capital. So that gives him a leg up to understand, you know, whether this is a good opportunity. I'm just a person who intuitively likes business. How would I even go about this? What would you say to somebody who's like listening and saying, that sounds interesting, but I have no investment banking or venture capital experience. I don't feel capable. Yeah. So th- it's a, I love the question. It's, you're, you're absolutely right. For me, because I had that experience, the most practical thing for me to do was to, to invest in people's companies, right? Mm-hmm. That, that was my area of expertise. But I'll give you like a great example. Uh, there's a woman that I met a number of years ago, and this is, these con- stories are so common, but like she was working um, at a consulting firm as an executive assistant. Mm-hmm. But on the side, her hobby was making candles. She mm-hmm. loved to make candles. So she started making her candles and selling them at a different, you know, came up with a brand and, you know, all this stuff and beautiful packaging and selling them on the weekends at like farmer's markets and fairs and things. And slowly but surely that business started taking off to the point where she ended up getting picked up by like several national retailers and building a big company. Like I couldn't do that. I can't make a candle to save my life. I'm right. sorry to say. <laughs> and so like, that's the thing is you may be, um, you know, there's so many great examples of people starting food brands, you know, it, it's really about, and this is what the 10% entrepreneur book does mm-hmm. is it says, we all have skills. We can all tap into those things. And if we have an area like where we don't have skills, we can find partners and stuff like that. Yeah. So like, even if you say to yourself, you know what, okay, I don't have investment experience, but I'd love to learn. And I have the financial capacity to do that. You can join an angel investing group. These things exist all over the country and there you'll be mentored because right. investing is a like a, is an apprenticeship business, right? And so right. there are a million ways to engage. I understand that the first impulse might be to say, I don't, I can't, I don't know how, mm-hmm. but I promise you all of us can do this. I love that answer. So Patrick, let's talk about FOMO and our financial lives, please, oh. because <laughs> boy, do we suffer from it oh my and goodness, we make crazy choices. I mean, the number of people who write into the show and ask me questions about crypto, of course. I mean, and it, it's like, wait a minute, like, let me just ask you a few questions. Do you have liquid savings? Do you have an investment account? Do you have retirement savings? No, no, no. Do you have a real estate portfolio that you're living off of perhaps? Like w- w- what's going on here? No, I just, you know, have $10,000. I like to invest in crypto. Um, it, it, there's so much going on here. Please help us navigate this so that people make a rational decision. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm glad you asked this question. I, um, I think a lot about this because when, I mean, I have so much crypto FOMO, let me tell you something, but like I lost all this money in the early two thousands in the tech markets and I yes. got burned. Me remember too. Remember those days? Yeah. I remember I was living in Argentina. You guys were up in New York and I was following all of my peers tips and buying stocks on all of these dot-com companies that, yeah. Yeah. You know I mean, went. I did some dumb things. And so I got burned and, and And I think it's funny, like people from our generation who lived through the tech bubble burst and then Mm -hmm. the financial crisis, like we're so gun shy, but if you, if you go up after that and you just, you've only seen up and to the right, you're sort of like, it's, I can understand how you'd be like, well, it's not going to go that bad. You know, the reality is that, um, I understand the FOMO and Mm -hmm. if you want to take 10% of your savings, if you have 10,000 and you want to put a thousand into crypto, like have at it because the worst you could do is lose 10%. But seeing people speculate when they couldn't tell you why it goes up every day or why it goes down is very scary. I also think the fact that people are taking their investment tips from chat rooms on Reddit, like Wall Mm -hmm. Street Bets, Mm -hmm. is really scary. And I think the third thing is if we think about what's fueling all of this is, um, and I hate to generalize, but you know, I, it is sort of true is number one is that you have people, it's easier than ever to invest. Like investing has been gamified by apps. Number two, we're all, especially during the pandemic, people were just stuck at home with nothing to do. Right. Um, And third is that, you know, the story that you hear, nobody talks about, like I was with a guy yesterday who told me a story. He bought Bitcoin. I guess he must've leveraged it. He went from $8,000 to over a million. And then it ended up falling. He, He ended up, now it's worth 50K. He never sold. Mm -hmm. And so like, there are so many stories like that, but nobody tells that story. They only tell about the person 
who became the millionaire, right? Because right. that's the FOMO generator. And so I just really encourage people to be, you know, if you want to play around, just keep it to 10% or less yeah. and then diversify because that's really, that's really the secret to investing. Yeah. You know, you treat it like play money, right? Like five yeah. to 10% of your overall portfolio do you can do some riskier things and, you know, not lose your pants. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. I, I, I definitely agree with that approach. There's also this herd mentality, which I know is such a big part of FOMO. You talk about it in the book, but like, I'll be honest, even a couple of weeks ago, I was researching a guest on the, for the show and I almost got so dragged into like his, like, you got to do crypto now. You got to learn from me now because like timing, like it has to be now or never, you're going to miss out. And it's like, oh yeah, L, maybe I need to do this. I'm like, wait, 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 what am I doing? This is not my priority right now. <laughs> it's so true. Like, listen, I actually, we, I've set up like a, a, I have a wallet and I'm, I have a couple hundred dollars that I play with and I bought some things and like, you know, I, I want to learn about it. I think it's interesting to know it's new technology. I like that kind of stuff. Right. But like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out and buy a hundred percent of my portfolio in Tesla either. Like you have, right. you know, that's the key. And I think that it's very really sad to me to see some people that wouldn't have an own a stock in their life, but are putting all their money in Dogecoin. And that happens all the time. Exactly. And that story is not going to end well. Yeah. 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 The story is not going to end well. Also, don't invest in things that you don't understand right and low-hanging fruit stocks and bonds are pretty easy to understand they're as boring as can be <laughs> yeah buy things you actually use i mean that really that's one of those things that like irritates me is like i, I like I, I would buy stocks and stuff but i'm not a stock picker i have like mutual funds and yeah and, like, me too i'm boring <laughs> but i'm like if i had just bought like apple you know what i mean like right. a ton of apple and just like kept it forever i mean oh my goodness so i I, I have all kinds of, you know, FOMO. I wish I enjoyed investing more in liquids, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so I want to ask you about your podcast, FOMO Sapiens, because I mean, this gives you a real into how this manifests. Is this, are you interviewing people who somehow have um, been able to overcome the foes? Is that what it is? Yeah. So the, the kind of theme of the show is, that we're in, we're in, we're gonna we're interviewing people who are living unique lives where they're kind of choosing their own path, and in doing so, they're able to despite the fact that they have so many opportunities they could do anything, they're kind of putting together their life in a way that they're able to really kind of show up every day and be their full self. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the idea that how can we learn from those people who've been able to lead exceptional lives because um, because we do live in a time where you can kind of do kind of anything you want within yeah. reason, obviously. But the problem is how do you choose? Right. And I think this is neat because it taps into that inspirational part of um, that positive part of FOMO that we talked about before, where you can really look at somebody else and really get motivated, get inspired. You call it jealous, but from a positive standpoint, right? Like, oh, if this person's doing this, like that's inspiring for me to go that route and take that path. Not that we, we don't want to copy somebody, but there's definitely so much to learn from others. Um, and, and to do it, not from a place of FOMO. <laughs> no, right? it's more about just saying, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, I, I, I ran a, a, a marathon. And the reason why is because one of my friends ran the marathon and I was like, you know, Ooh, maybe I should do that. But I had never run more than like, I don't know, five miles, 10 miles, something like, so I decided I'm going to sign up for a half marathon first and see, right. do I even like this? And that's the thing about FOMO as a motivator is FOMO is the tap on our shoulder. You know, there's like the good angel and the bad angel, the tap, mm -hmm. tap, tap. And the, the bad angel is like, go all in. And the good angel is like, dip a toe, try it out, figure out if the perception something is so great is actually true, or if that perception is deception. And then make a rational decision based on the facts rather than fear or emotion. That's like, it's so simple. But, um, and now that I know that this is the secret to overcoming FOMO, like I'm much more um, able to manage and re regulate my emotions because right. I feel FOMO every day, all day long, but now right. I have the tools. Yeah. Having the, that tool. I love that. Having that tool and also the self-awareness that you spoke about before, where you know yourself and your sense of mission and purpose, and you have that maturity to say, this is definitely not for me. Like, it's not something that it sounds great for that person, but it just, 
it, my personality doesn't go with that. It's not going to make me feel lit up. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be so exciting. Um, you know, I think the, those two things go really hand in hand to combat this. Patrick, I'd love to hear from you. You told us a little bit about, yeah, you know, the mutual funds and a little bit of the FOMO from, you know, the crypto and all this stuff. But I'd really love to hear you've had, you talked to us about, you know, what happened those days um, in the bank and uh, the recession, the, <laughs> the recession and all that. But um, tell us about your own relationship with money growing up, because you very well know at this point that so much of the way we behave with money as adults has to do with things that we learned in, you know, in our home, parents' home or growing up and all that. Perhaps there's some stories or lessons that you learned growing up, whether they, you know, whether they served you or whether you decided that these things I'm going to rewrite, like I'm getting rid of this altogether. Is there anything that comes up that you feel really played a strong part in your own money mindset and behavior today? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I really appreciate it. So number one is I think on the positive side, I was taught, um, you know, I come from a small town in Maine, people, mm -hmm. you know, very blue collar kind of town. Um, people are not materialistic at all. Like mm -hmm. people, you know, I remember it was like, you got to choose like three pairs of pants for back to school right. and like three shirts. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we just didn't mm -hmm. have access anything. Um, and, and that's kind of amazing. I look now and I'm like, wow, that was really chill. And it's just conscious because then, then like, I, I, I hear you and I remember us living in Manhattan with like all this affluence and this like oh my God. access to all of this. <laughs> I used to spend money on the dumbest things. And I just, I cause I think I was, it was like a stress relief or something. Yes. I'd go to J crew and buy it like was. dumb things. It was, um, yeah. yeah. It, for me, it was, yeah. So I'm glad. And so that, that was cool. And then also my parents were, you know, I learned to save from an early age. So I've always been really good about saving. That's cool. Now, the flip side, what I realized actually two years ago um, was I, and I think I don't want to, I'm not blaming my parents, but this is just the culture of where I grew up is massive scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. Massive. Like I was so I, I hadn't, I didn't move apartments for many years. Cause I was like, well, this is good enough. And I don't want to like, you know, I don't need more than this. So I'll just stay in this apartment. And then one day in the middle of the pandemic, I ordered a Peloton and I looked around and I was like, I have nowhere to put the Peloton. Right. And so I was talking to a friend of mine who's a coach. And she said, you do realize that you have a scarcity mindset. You're so worried about preserving what you have that you're not willing to move beyond that. And the minute I saw that in myself, I was like, oh my goodness. And so I ended up moving apartments and making a bunch of changes mm -hmm. that in the end of the day, like an abundance mindset, it is really, it can drive a lot of positive change in your life. Yeah. It's so interesting because you probably did overcome part parts of that, but just like something was there still lingering because, you know, the part of you that did start investing in all these companies um, 10 years ago um, must have, you know, gone against that scarcity yes. mindset that perhaps was in your environment. Well, you know, though, the reality is I think <laughs> this is my big, I'm, now I'm giving you like some some of some of the, the truth of it all is like which I would always do but this is the next level is that you know you start investing in companies and you think oh like I'll you know I can live off of it's like I thought like I could live off of being an angel investor but then <laughs> you're, you're sort of like you realize oh no it'll take 10 years uh -huh. to get this money back if I get it at all so you have to sort of have a long-term plan yeah and my own mindset was always like I'm going to invest every excess dollar into companies but then you start to realize, well, no, I'd like to also have a nicer place and have these. So you have to kind of find the balance. Yes. Yeah. So which brings me to my next question about financial habits. Talk to us a little bit about some of those habits that you practice regularly that you feel have paid off. So I have, you know, I, I keep pretty detailed record of like all my investments and what their value adds. So I kind of have a sense of portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that's important to me. Another thing that's important to me is I try to keep my stuff really simple. So actually I have like two credit cards. I charge everything to the credit cards. I monitor them to see, because you never know what's going to creep in there. You're always yes. kind of shocked. You're like, I don't remember buying that. Right. Um, that's really helpful. And then another thing is, again, because I invest a lot of money in privates mm -hmm. where I spend time, like when it comes to publics, I don't enjoy it. I'm not good at it. So I simply outsource that to a money manager mm -hmm. who then, you know, manages all of that stuff. And so that really helps me 
to just set it and forget it. Yes. And then I have a wonderful accountant. So I work for myself. I have, you know, set up set by RA and obviously track all my expenses so that I'm able to write them off. And so, you know, our tax system really ben- is incredibly um, incentivizes entrepreneurship. because Yes, we can- it does. And so one thing I never even realized when I worked for big companies is like people who have their own businesses are, it's not like you're, you're not doing anything naughty. It's like this, it's allowed. Yeah. And so make sure you know the rules so that you can take advantage of all those, those, those things. Yeah. I love your tips. Yeah. Get yourself a good accountant because yeah. um, <laughs> it's important. And um, yeah, I, I love that you said about keeping detailed records. You said it in the context of the companies that you invest in. But one of the things that I tell my students a lot is, you know, when you're, and you probably have seen this a lot, when you're starting your 10% thing, let's say it's a side hustle and this thing is growing and it's bringing in income. A lot of people just don't take the time to get organized and like things get, you know, revenue, you, you take 10 coaching clients and you all of a sudden there's like $30,000, $130,000 coming into your account and you're using it also for groceries and things mm-hmm. that in family vacation. I'm like, no, 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 you don't do that. That's not how you grow. You have to really be systematic about your business and your personal life and the monies that they don't get intermingled or they get mingled in a, in a systematic, logical way that makes sense, that it's pre- premeditated. That's really good advice. And I think a lot of people, you know, they get into this stuff and they, they don't recognize, you're thinking very short term, but in the long right. run, the idea is, you, you know, you're building something that's going to continue to grow and right. you need to be organized about it. Right. In order to grow it. It's not um, fun, but you got to do it. It's not fun, but you got to do it. But it makes it, it's going to pay off. <laughs> it's going to pay off. It's going to make it more fun down the line. Um, Patrick, let's do what I like to call Jewish Money Matters fill in the blanks. And this is a part of the show where, where I'll give you an open-ended sentence and you just finish it with the first thing that comes to mind, okay? okay. All right. Um, first thing is, Patrick, when you give charity, when I give charity, I like to give two. Sesame Workshop really? is my number one and my universities I went to. Really? So cute. I did not know that about you. That's so cool. I'm on the, and- board, the leadership council there. Uh-huh. And the reason I support them is their work with refugees. Right. Both in, you know, whether it's Venezuelan or Rohingya or Syrian, um, they create incredible programs for, for refugee children who mm-hmm. are in school that are and are dealing with deep trauma. So I saw refugees as my, for me, the biggest global challenge uh, yeah. over the last couple of years. And I found, a, I knew some people there and they said, do you want to get involved? So I did. Wow. Good for you. And you said your university, is that the other thing you said? Yeah. I give to both undergrad and grad, which wow. sometimes I'm like, do they really need my money? But I, I got, um, Georgetown gave me a lot of money when I went there. Yeah. And so I feel like I gratitude right? committed to giving back to them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. That's, that's an interesting, I actually don't give to Tufts and don't give to NYU. And I've always thought about that, um, you know, but I have other causes that, but yeah. Is, I, I think the thing about that, by the way, as somebody who did fundraising for both these schools is like HBS never expects to be your number one or number two. They know that we have all these things, but you know, they're always happy to receive something. So even if it's a hundred dollars a year, right. it's, you know, it's great. Very appreciated. They, they're, that's what I've noticed. Yeah. 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 I'd like to make more money because. Because money and flexibility and autonomy are highly correlated and I oh. value those. Yeah. We didn't have that in our early twenties, Patrick. Let's no. We did not have flexibility. <laughs> but you know, you know I, at the time I didn't expect it either. I was like, yeah. this is that, you know, it's kind of like, this is just a, you got to do it. Yeah, you're right. We didn't expect it. We thought like we're going through this because that's what you do. Yeah. Um, maybe you had a bigger plan. I don't really no. think I had a plan. Oh, you didn't have a plan either. Zero. Oh, I, I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, everybody said, got a job in investment banking. So that's what I'm going to do. I don't think it's that way anymore, more, by the way. Like, I think now I think people are like 22 year olds are like, wait, why am I not the CEO of this company? (laughs) (laughs) Good for them, by the way. I appreciate, I admire that. I do too. I want to tell you something. I remember being there till one in the morning and day in and day out. And just like this stuff was not for me. Evidently I have a lot more fun 
talking to you and yeah. doing this every single day of my life, but I'm working with my students. But I remember thinking, Patrick, I don't know if this happened to you. I'm like, I don't know anybody like that's older than me in this building that I want to be like when I grow up. And yes. that was such a wake up call. It's like, that's scary. Like if I'm spending so much time and giving my energy to a place where I don't find any role models, something's got to get, that's a big red flag. It's so good what you say. The, the thing I would say at that time though, was that I didn't know anybody in that building. I also didn't know anybody <laughs> outside of that building because I was just so, you know what I mean? You're kind of like- We didn't have time to know anybody. <laughs> yeah, I just was very, I hadn't been exposed to those kinds of things. And also at that time, like I, you know, I thought I wanted to be an economist and go to like get a PhD in econ and stuff, which I would have been terrible at. So I would have been so bad. By the way, my degree's in economics. What, what was I thinking? Yeah, I mean- I'm glad I learned it, but it's sort of like the things, the world has changed. Like the things that we're able to do now because of technology, it's like right. these doors have opened for us. And at the time it feels like there was just fewer, it was like, it was like finance or consulting. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, those were the choices. All right. Something I wish I'd learn about money growing up is. Uh, okay. That even if something like crypto or whatever is high risk and may eventually fall, but yeah. if you get in early and you're sensible about how much you put, it can still be a great investment. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Yes. Like Southwest Airlines, right? <laughs> yeah. Just like it may be Apple. that it's, it's a total, not a, you know, it's Bust. like kind of, or whatever, it's kind of like um, a fad or something. But like, if you're, if you realize that and you just get in quick and get out, like mm -hmm. you can still make good money. Right. But again, like we said before, like just use your play money, please. Precisely. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, money, spiritual or physical? What do you think? Ooh. Physical. Hmm. Very much so, right? You need it. You need it to feed somebody else. Yeah. Something I, yeah. Something I splurge on unapologetically is travel. Good for you. Yeah, I make pretend. I, I don't even look at the numbers. I just go. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. I was a big traveler in my days. Not so much anymore. I have a family. So it's not like I was, I was in New York last week. Okay. That's oh my goodness. I, I, yeah. I get to go. I get, I get to, I have a very supportive husband. I do get to go away. Um, um, and my kids are older now, so it's, you know, it's, it's easier, but, um, Patrick saver or I mean, spender or saver. I think I know the answer to that. Saver. Yes. Yes. And finally I'm Patrick McGinnis and today I'm most grateful for Oh, I am most grateful for the fact that I'm able to spend my time sharing my ideas mm. and maybe changing, I do think, changing the way people do things so that they have a better approach to living their lives. Wow. I so appreciate that answer. Patrick McGinnis, thank you so much. Everybody, the book is Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision-Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. Highly recommend it. Your other book is The 10% Entrepreneur, and we're going to be sure to subscribe to FOMO Sapiens as well. And where can we find you and connect with you? You can find me at patrickmcginnis.com or fomosapiens.com. And I'm on mm -hmm. Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis and on Twitter at PJ McGinnis. And on LinkedIn. I'm at all the places, but if you go to patrickmcginnis.com, you'll have the links to everything. Amazing. Thank you so much, Patrick. It was so fun to reconnect. Thank you, Yael.